public cloud start, uh, you, use the, the, uh, you, you can use your data center, but, but the optimum is actually use across the state, where it makes sense for you to uh, work across it. Right. Uh, right. Now, the point is this, from a, from a, from a cloud perspective, Microsoft that, uh, is the only person who actually works in this way in terms of from a hybrid perspective, which allows you to use both your it allows you to use both your data center and the public cloud and actually work between the two. So where it makes sense for you to actually do that, uh, because, uh, and in fact, in the world, there are only three people with hyperscale data centers across the world, Google, AWS, which is Amazon Web Services, and Microsoft. Those are kind of the only three people with what I call hyper, hyperscale data centers across the world. Now, uh, some people work on the left, which is kind of, they only work in terms of in, in your own data center, they will sell you software, they will sell you hardware in your own data center, but they don't do anything in the cloud. Some people work like uh, Google will work in the cloud, but they, will do, they won't touch your data center. We're the only people who actually kind of work across the two, right? And, and, and really, from a Gartner perspective, in terms of industry validation, we kind of we lead in all the quadrants uh, from a Gartner perspective, uh, right? So, as I said, it's, it's what enables this is hyperscale infrastructure. So we've got, actually got 22 online data centers across the world. Uh, some of them have been operational. So I think last, uh, over the past few months, we've, we've, uh, we've announced we're going to do another data center in, in the UK. Uh, we've got one in Ireland at the moment and two data centers in Germany. So that's kind of what enables it, really. Right? So, what is Azure? What we have is got a combination of things. You actually got the things that you can buy off the shelf, like Office 365, CRM Online, Power BI, and mobility. So that's, like, that's like what we call the software as a service solution. Those are the things that you buy. And then, on, uh, and then depending on kind of what you want, you've actually got things that are focused around developers, so things that you develop, developer and application platform. You've got a platform around analytics, uh, which is basically taking your data and analyzing it and, and big data. We've got platforms around the Internet of Things, and we've got platform around infrastructure, the cloud infrastructure. And that's really kind of uh, how we lead the journey to the cloud. So you can actually get uh, the package bits, you can actually get uh, platforms, and you can get infrastructure as well. So, as I said, for us, what, what makes us unique? Uh, we're hyperscale. We work hybrid, nobody else but work hybrid, and it's enterprise proven, really. So enterprise, it works for, for the enterprise. It's not a consumer-based platform, it's actually focused from an enterprise perspective, right? The other thing, so this is kind of the hybrid, that we work across uh, hybrid. Uh, the other thing is that it's open and it's flexible. Right? Open meaning that uh, we, it's not restricted to Microsoft technologies. We do Linux, we do uh, open source, we do all sorts of things. So uh, it's a platform that allows you to do all sorts of things. So from the, uh, from the infrastructure perspective, from the database perspective, uh, all sorts of middleware and databases, from the apps perspective, applications perspective, uh, we do all sorts of things and, and management. So we're quite, it's very open and it's very flexible. The other thing is uh, where the Azure platform that focuses around developer and IT productivity. So if you're a professional IT pro, you, it's a platform that can you, you want to use, right? And obviously, we, we it's, it's used for software accessibility. So things like Office 365, Salesforce.com, and uh, CRM Online, uh, you can actually get off the platform as well. And finally, it's trustworthy. Uh, we're, from a, from a platform perspective, we've got more compliance certificates than any other cloud, really, uh, from a compliance perspective, which to a degree is one of the things of, of this workshop by the data protection workshop. So, who, who uses Azure? So, uh, as you said, we've got 22 data centers, and I'm not going to go through all this. Uh, so, every month we've got one trillion messages delivered to it, we've got 
60 billion hits to the website uh, run, run on the Azure Web App Service. Uh, we've got 50 trillion story objects on the platform. And this is kind of, and they're working day in, day out. Uh, and we're, we're gaining kind of 100,000 new Azure customers every single month. Because basically it makes sense for you to actually kind of do it quickly. Right? And the other thing is probably about 60% of uh, Fortune 500 use the Microsoft Cloud in some shape or form. Uh, in Ghana, increasingly people are kind of coming to the realization that it makes sense to have cloud to, uh, to complement any infrastructure they've got in terms of going forward. Uh, right? So getting started, what's, what, what does it mean? Now, if you've got an IT operation, probably about, uh, and this is general, it probably differs from country to country, probably about 50% of your time, uh, or your, your effort and resource and investment is actually around day-to-day -day operations, i.e. Right? application operations. So things like backup, running a patch, uh, doing, uh, doing backup tapes, uh, actually as, as, the, as the kind of a customer meeting yesterday. And uh, they're kind of, they, they bought uh, a system, they replicate it, then uh, every, every day they have got run backup to send it to a bank somewhere, go and put it somewhere. So ask them a question, which is, right, so if something happened and you really needed to use the tapes, how long would it take you to actually get the thing back online again? So I said, hmm, right. Uh, we've tried it, it takes about uh, half a day. Uh, it's, it's kind of what, uh, so we're saying actually, maybe if you use the cloud, it, it might, it's there instantly and you can get it instantly. So, so actually, Part 50% is around operations. It's actually, about 15% of your time is actually spent or your, and your investments around what, what we call package applications. So these are things that, frankly, give you no, uh, no competitive advantage. So the exchange that you run is the same as the ex exchange that everybody runs. So uh, if, if in terms of all the, all the office that you run is the same as office everywhere. So it's a package app. You took it off the shelf, you, put it, you gave it to your, your customers. So about, that's about 15% of your investment. And 10% of your investment is around new business things. And then 25% is about things that are customized for you. And these are things that give you the competitive advantage. Maybe it might be your core banking system or something like that. So really what we're saying is, actually to get started, the, the number of things that you give you, right? The first one, things that are operational, like backup, right? Like running your operations, like running a pack. Uh, you've got a lot of that, right? And that's probably used about 5 to 10% of the time. So that's really probably the, the best place to start because the return on investment on, in terms of moving that into the cloud, one, uh, it doesn't, it, it, it's not taking your data. Uh, I know some people have a hang on by how put your data in but In terms of your operations, uh, operation stuff, it actually, they're low risk and the, and the return on investment tends to be high. So that's where we would suggesting stats, right, in terms of operations. Then the apps that you've bought, right, this is the, 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 the exchange online that you run, uh, or, or let's say you run a, a kind of some sort of SQL database or something like that. Think about what can you stop doing using the software model, i.e. Office 365, Exchange, SharePoint, uh, those servers, Visual Studio if you use it for development, those sorts of things. Question is, can you stop using it? Can you move that infrastructure? Can you use that infrastructure for something else and move that to the cloud? Because really what you're going to get is, in fact, probably more than what, you, what you've got by actually running it yourself. So that's the second thing to say. Should you do that? And the third one is the stuff that you would like to build. The stuff that everybody's been saying for a while, that you've been saying for a while, yes, I want to do this. Uh, but you have not had the bandwidth or the resource or the, the stuff. Now there's, a, there's an opportunity. The opportunity is you don't, have to, you don't have to spend six months building a server, build a server room, putting stuff there. You can actually get the compute power now, do it, do the development in the cloud, uh, and you get everything instantly. So using the platform as a service building blocks, you can actually get developer tools, you can get a, a database, you can actually start building it stuff. Great. It makes it more productive and it's less infrastructure. So you go straight to the idea as opposed to kind of say, spend probably about 80% setting up the infrastructure, then testing it. So that's another way you can go. And then finally, 
what we recommend is that your, for, for the existing applications that are your core bits that you built, probably leave 80% of it there for now. Because really, that's, that's the bit. And then if there's small high burst workloads, then it probably makes sense to actually take them to the cloud. That's really uh, kind of how you could actually use the cloud, uh, taking into, into, into effect your consideration, where you are uh, in terms of your IT, in terms of use the cloud to make your business much more efficient and do more. Because the time and efforts that you have to save, like can, for example, moving your operation, uh, your operation aspects into the cloud gives you bandwidth to actually spend on the new business app, the things that actually make, uh, get benefits for the business. That's really it. So just to summarize, how does intelligent cloud kind of help you achieve for more? Really, it reduces your cost and kind of makes, uh, and makes you more efficient. Right, uh, in, it allows you to spend time on things that increase revenue with your existing assets. So, with your existing assets, you can always get things to actually spend time on things that increase revenue, and it allows you to create new business models. That's really going to be the, the kind of the end of the talk session. Now, just I'll, I'll now kind of open it up, and people, we've probably got about 15, 10, 15 minutes to actually ask some questions. Thank you. Um, may I ask, connectivity is still an issue. Um, I know it's getting to improve. How is it uh, Azure optimized for the connectivity that we have uh, in the world? Yeah. Azure is optimized um, for connectivity. So it's, kind of, it's, it's, it's really interesting insofar as uh, people say kind of connectivity is the issue, but our connectivity has actually got better, infinitely better in the last uh, 10 years. I remember kind of when, I, when I moved to Ghana in 2010, we had one cable, internet cable, which was SAT3, yeah? Uh, at the moment, we've got probably about five. And then we've actually got the mobile operators uh, going on. So I, I don't think internet has, has, is no longer a barrier. And the also thing is that internet cost is also coming down. Um, okay, we're just going to say something around internet. And, and the cloud. So, look at the internet and what we do in the cloud. Most of the operations that we usually carry out in the organization is done in Microsoft data centers. All you basically do is connect to that service and then just bring it down to your to your to your to your to your on, on premise organization. So it's just like going onto the internet and clicking stuff and having it down somewhere and you just consume it. And uh, before Microsoft brings this, these kind of technologies to a region, we make sure that we attach the connectivity in the in the, in the country because we don't want to bring something down here for people to be doing that is nowhere near the internet and all we we take all of these things into consideration before we make it available in the region. So if you look across Africa, there are some countries where we don't offer these services because the connectivity doesn't meet the standards for which we deem these solutions to work. Is that clear? Yeah, sure. Let, let me just add another thing. So um, at the moment, right, everybody can use this Facebook. I use Office 365 exactly on this thing. Yeah, and I use it everywhere across the country. Uh, mostly I'm using it with my mobile phone, in fact. Uh, what we need to do today, the screen back, but it's my mobile phone that's using the internet. So internet quality is not an issue anymore for, for cloud-based services, for at least for Ghana. Okay. What I would say is, if your concern is on stability, you want to get uh, uh, something with Nandas to, to take care of that uh, on and off kind of situation that you would want to avoid. But when it comes to the quality, I think we're 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 we're, we're at the right point uh, currently. It's just you just need to make sure that you are connected and we have that scale. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, and the modern population uh, is always an issue. Uh, we want to subscribe to uh, cloud-based services. I would like to know whether um, the buyer or the one who wants the subscriber has an where he wants his data stored, say a country that he believes that uh, will not go and get caught on the spending. Yes, uh, exactly that. 
because of that, you tell the that crap. It's your data, you tell them where you want it, uh, yeah, where, you want it where you want it to be. And uh, in fact, Microsoft is the only person that's in contempt, uh, the only technology company that's in contempt with the US government for refusing to actually give hand over somebody's data which was based in an island data center. Uh, the US government said they wanted it. We said to them, it makes sense for you to go and talk to the person before you get it. If, you, if the person says yes, we'll give it to you. And uh, they insisted they wanted to be refused. So there's a case at the moment going the I call where we're in contact, we haven't given it to them because it's not our data, as I said, it's your data, you tell us where it goes. Uh, do you want to add to that, Eva? Yeah. No, thank you. So, so, so I, I'm not sure where the conference yesterday or not, but that was the work of the key topics that we discussed. And, you know, our case was around the data and where data sits. Is, is very important and it's at the center of our our operation. We embrace privacy and security all across the, the globe. And so because you know as Derek said, you own the data, we are we, we are very transparent about where your data is, who access your data, what do you do with the data, and because at the end of the day it is it is your data. So in the contract that we have you have, you know, we tell you where your data is and you have the right to choose which data center that your data will, will reside. And normally we would propose for a latency uh, reasons, you know, like the closest data centers to the country where we, where we offer the, uh, the cloud services. So for Ghana, we've got a number of data centers in, uh, in Europe. So this is the closest to you. And, and thus ensure that, I mean, you know, like here, we address the latency issue. So, in, you know, like in a, in, in a nutshell, it's your data, we have to be very transparent about where your data sits, and, and you have the choice and the final say of where the data is. And, and as Derek said, actually, you're the only company that uh, we sued the US government three times. Might come as a surprise, but I'll just very quickly, the first one, uh, the, the, the FBI had asked for uh, information, access information for one of our largest clients in the US. We pushed that, you know, a lot of back and forth, uh, you know, like exchange, and at the end of the day, you know, like our position was, if you need this data, you have to go to the border of the state. Which is company X. And you know, that was the first one to really give the, the data. The second one, and this was an enterprise, the second one was more of a consumer, and this is the Warren case, and you know, like this is published, uh, you know, it's published everywhere. Um, we are in our third round uh, with, the, with the different courts, and we believe that this is going to go to the Supreme Court in the US. And so, where we are today, it's the US government has issued a warrant case, a warrant, to uh, access the data that sits in Ireland for an Irish national. That means, just imagine that the US uh, yeah, government would search a, warrant, uh, a search warrant to come and search your house in Ghana. So, you know, like, logically, uh, it doesn't work. They, you know, a, a different jurisdiction do not have the right to search your house in a different jurisdiction. And thus, our position was that this is this data is not for an American citizen. It doesn't sit in the U.S. If you want to have access to this information, you have to talk to the Irish government and have the Irish government go through the legal process to access this information. We've gone a long way. Uh, we haven't given the data. Uh, uh, yet, because we believe that the data is owned by the person who sits in Irish, it's not, it's not our data. And the, the Irish government is supporting us, and we've got a number of companies, trade associations, who are really supporting, uh, supporting that notion. And that goes back to our commitment. Uh, if there are failovers, uh, where is the nearest source of the data. Now we have local redundant, we have zone redundant, and we have geo redundant. So locally redundant we have it three times across the same data center. As we said, the data center is a very interesting 
side of the, the record too, of YouTube replication three times across that way. Now, it's so redundant that you can take the euro, for example, we replicate it three times in this data center. Then, in another country within the 300 miles, we replicate it again in the euro. Now, when you choose geo, you replicate it in Europe, then it's replicated in either North America or South America, across across the world, so that when you want to retrieve your information, or when there's a failure, but there's always, your data is always present. How that, how that answers is that. Yeah. How is it easy to back up outside the microservice structure? By when you say back up outside the microservice structure, what because you still the data is so mild, I'm using microservice, yeah. doing everything on the platform. But as you might back up policy, you might use another policy to do it. So I want to be keeping my data outside. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I want to have a copy outside the platform. Yeah. Yeah. Copy okay. Let's let's not make it complicated. Let's say I want to use in Word. You know, the process, and I've got millions of pages, and um, I've been saving it for open source. And I, I decide, okay, um, I want to back up, you know, all, all the data that I've processed on Azure to a totally different platform outside. How easy it is. So if, if you're saying, for example, if you're saying, for example, what you've got, you've got some data, you've got a database of stuff, right? Uh, that's really, you want to actually put some, uh, you want to use Azure to actually kind of replicate that database, let's call it an SQL database. But you want to also kind of do that in, put, replicate that in Amazon Web Services. Yeah, that's possible, uh, because we kind of, as I said, we're open, we're flexible. We work with Amazon, uh, we work, that's possible, right? Uh, I think, uh, because I think uh, I've promised uh, Techie, you will get there for 10 o'clock, so I think we need to actually do two more questions. Yes, uh, what was when you get a data center. Uh, for example, when you show the chart, I don't that um, all your data centers are across Europe and uh, North America, the Asia. Mm -hmm. You have none in Africa. Mm -hmm. At the moment. You have none in Africa at the moment. So yeah, it's a combination of things in terms of what, what's where to locate a kind of a hyper data in terms of availability of infrastructure, obviously a critical thing is actually power because these things are huge and they, 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 they kind of take an enormous amount of power. Uh, the second thing is around uh, climate as well because really uh, they're huge, they generate enormous amounts of power. It, means they, uh, it, it, kind of, it creates a sense of heat. So uh, it, it tends to be so. Uh, Brad Smith, who's kind of uh, one of our guys, tells, tells, tells the joke that says, uh, Island is like. Uh, the island is like the uh, the the Swiss of data centers. The reason it's it's there is that it's never too hot, it's never too cold. But it's too cold, and you can use uh, you can use cool air to circulate. Now the fourth thing is is around also around um, around capacity and latency. I how much how much. Uh, how much data is actually being replicated there? So that's another thing. So, so as as uh, loads, so as loads of data is represented in the country, it then starts to make economic sense to say, should we actually have a hyperscale uh, data center in that area? Yeah. So, and the fifth thing is actually obviously the regulatory regime. So, for example, back to my 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 uh, the bit in my speech around data protection, uh, it's to say it makes sense if if it doesn't make sense to go and put. Uh, a hyperscale data center in a, in a jurisdiction that has no data protection uh, thing. So, so that's kind of, that's also some part of it. So that's all. Uh, with those are all the inputs that are going to kind of work. Uh, where, where does it make sense to have the hyperscale, right? Um, if I'm running and I'm actually set set, definitely I would rather go to Samaritan to purchase some of these services. So in your case, how should I come? I don't think that. Are you talking about licensing? No. Certificate services. Oh, certificate services. Um, what what with with um with 
with Azure, what you pretty much with is, with is uh, you do is work with your uh, uh, your local local uh, service internet service provider, and through that you can build your, your own you can build a VPN uh, that you can use that you have uh, keys and uh, certificates that you can use to to uh, to, to connect uh, to Azure. Azure has the facility the capability to you know, have you to generate your own keys and certificates. So you just have to work with your local. Uh, uh, internet service provider and you can do your own VPN uh, to secure VPN to, to get it. Okay. 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 Let me try to understand this point. So when you're using Azure for example, and uh, you're connected to you're using platform as a service, you have Windows Server on a virtual machine running on Azure, you you wouldn't need any certificate because we have made sure that everything is certified on the market. So we have made sure that it's it's compliant to all standards, and uh, the, the the connection that you use to connect to is secure. So we handle all of that from our end. We just connect to the server. I hope that gives you more clarity. Like the consent is, for example, if I secure an email, and of course I'm I will need to control my the admin encryption. So okay, is this the encryption? Ah, oh right. Do you want to kind of do you want to add some kind of power to the encryption? Okay, so the the uh the the scenario that the scenario that I I I can explain first, right? There's some um where um more of a hybrid case, you have a data, your own data center, and let's say you want to, you want to communicate uh, with um, Azure. Um, that, that, that you, need, uh, you need to work with a local service provider to make sure that um, you, know, you have a, 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 a secure VPN where you have um, the, uh, the keys and certificates to do the communication. But when you, that's, um, uh, and most of that comes with uh, what you say, the infrastructure as a service. But when it comes to um, software as a service, uh, we, we, we take our, we, we take our um, uh, the Office 3, uh, Office 360, uh, Microsoft takes care of all of that. So, so just for you to know, we were discussing this on the you know, earlier. We have different levels of authentication. I mean, the encryption, one, one thing is that encryption for data, not just in transfer. And then we have different levels of authentication in order to ensure that your data is safe. And so just to give you an example, we go to the NC data center in uh, it's one of our largest uh, data centers in uh, in Bradman. Uh, there's a quite interesting story is that if you manage to pass the first gate and the second gate, uh, they weigh you in afterwards and they weigh you out to ensure and that that's you that to ensure that nothing had gone had gone out with you. That's number one, but it's it's a it, it is some of the safety measures needed. And then if you pass all the security and your credentials will allow you to get in there. And if you go to the racks and you pull one of the racks and you walk away with it, you will not be able to access any piece of information on that because it's encrypted and you've got like you know the big locker and other levels of uh, you know security measures and layers and big put on that. And, and so it's it's very hard to really break through the uh, you know like uh, the security in the data center. Some people and you know like uh, the I think the smart hacker or the uh, you know the, the, the legitimate hackers they they would get smarter. So what we have done and what we announced last October is uh, that we are investing Three million dollars for security only to cover three aspects. One is that we have hired the best of class in the security uh, sector. Right. The second point is that we are investing in R and D to continue have uh, and continue have uh, uh, the, the, the latest innovative uh, security software and, and, and measures that we need to have on our data center. And the third point, which is very important, we continue to like you know either acquire uh, you know or develop 
uh, uh, you know, like acquired the security companies, and you, have, you probably might have heard that recently we acquired two security companies in, uh, you know, from Israel as well as others uh, to ensure that we have the latest and the greatest and we stay ahead of the curve. And at the end of the day, it's all about our commitment to ensure that your data is safe from. As a company, you know, cloud is our big bet. And, you know, we invested quite a lot of, of, of money in the cloud. And it's all about the trust. So if the trust is broken, we lose you as a customer. And if we lose you as a customer, then we lose all the investment. So that's why, you know, like as, as Derek said, the privacy and security is at the core of our operation. Because that is the asset to ensure that we have your trust to use the cloud whether I mean, the infrastructure or the productivity tool or the different applications, it doesn't matter. Great. Okay, so um, I think... Uh, yeah, we're pressed for time. So we're we'll pressed for time. The Data Protection Commission event is beginning yeah. after 10 o'clock. So right. we would like to say thank you. Thank you very much for coming. If you're interested, get uh, somebody uh, in terms of exploring more. Uh, get somebody's details, uh, have a chat with us. Yeah? Okay. Thanks. So have a great conference. Thank you.